it's a pleasure actually it's a pleasure to speak to apnt I and mean, they are masters of sdn and nmfd uh, so basically this talk is about our research actually ending at our research which has been done by my student subharthi pal his name is here and uh, unfortunately he is graduating this semester um, and so uh, you will see the the quality of the work that he has done uh, in this one so this is about sdn mfd and what the carriers can do with these so i will talk about sdn version 1 and version 2 actually and um, and then um, how does mfd fit into what we are doing and how really mfd can be extended and in the, to clouds of clouds in the work that we are doing so I know when you have a talk like this, uh, I don't know how many people are online, online or how many will listen later, but um, uh, I just allow for the possibility that some of them are hearing the word SDN for the first time. So those of you who are really expert in SDN, please hold on for the next two, three slides so that everybody comes up to the same speed. And uh, so I'm going to start with just distinguishing between the data plane and the control plane. And um, actually, it turns out that the telephone companies or the carriers have better distinction of data plane and control plane than the internet people, the old um, um, methods. Um, basically, the data plane is something that the user sends. Data plane consists of all the packets that the user sends. And but the network has to send a lot more than that. And what else the network does other than the user's stuff is called control plane. That is the simplest definition. One good example of control plane is routing tables. So the routing tables are prepared even if there are no user data packets going in that direction. And so that is all control plane. And if the packets are going in that direction, then the data plane uses that table. So making the table is control. Using the table is data plane. So the first thing that was invented in this direction by Stanford was open flow. And the idea was that really we could put all the control in the central place and, um, and leave, actually right now all the switches have both. They have, they have logic for making the routing tables and um, they have logic for using those routing tables. So all the routers, all the switches do both of the works. And so the idea was that you know we can take out the first part, which is the control part, and put it into the central place and central controller, and uh, and then leave the switches with the forwarding element, which just uses the table. So the table comes to the to the switch from the controller, and the proto then you need a protocol between the controller and the forwarding element, so that um, <coughs> so that um, the table can be transferred. And so that is the protocol which is called open flow. And um, the, the idea actually came around because initially um, Martin Casado was doing some security research and he noticed that most of the security is done at the edges of the network like firewalls and we really need to do it in the center so every node has to be monitored. So he centralized all the security policies in the central controller and then they noticed that it is not just security, it could be any other policy as well. And then it does not have to be policy, it could be routing table as well. So that's how we ended up from security research to open flow. And, um, and, that, and then finally, after this central controller was found, then they said, well, now that we have central point, we can change the network in an instant. Whatever we want to do, we can change very fast. So that, again, Martin Casado came up with the word software defined networking, SDN which basically means that sitting at the center there, you can see that person, he can change the network in any shape, in any way you want, just from the central place. So that is SDN. Um, however, the life has not been the same every year. Basically, one of the problems that um, has that, you know, all of us, including the researchers as well as the carriers and everybody who has to deploy is that things are changing just too fast. Just in last four years, I have noticed here, you notice here that we have open flow first. By the time we started open flow in implementation, oh, we said, no, 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 really what you need to do is SDN. We started doing SDN, the next year we are told, no, you are really doing, you need to do MFV. And we started doing MFV, then we said, no, there is another version of SDN. And so the question is, 
what is it that we do and let's see how why why all this is happening so first of all what is SDN some people might say SDN is open flow some people will say no really it should be a standard southbound API and I will explain in a minute why southbound basically um, in a picture when it comes to the place and the third, some people say, no, no, actually centralization of control plane is SDN. And some will say, no, separation of control and data plane is SDN. And actually, none of these are SDN because all of these are how. Maybe one of these methods you can do SDN, but this is how, not what. And the problem with how is when you define something with a how, then you lose all the innovation that you can do to get there. Because how tells you how to get there, and then that's it. And then you have to follow that route. And that's not what AT&T does, and that's what researchers do, right? I mean, we are all here to find the best way to get there. So let's find out what is it that we want to get there. We're building a little bit more on the ONF definition. So ONF is the Open Networking Foundation, and this is the official definition of SDN according to them. The physical separation of network control plane from the forwarding plane, where the control plane controls several devices and, and, and on and on. I have blued, I have put something in the blue which I feel is not correct. Because this is again telling me, like I said in the previous cartoon, is how. Separation of network and control plane, I mean before I had this control plane definition, I did, I mean, you know, most of us didn't even worry about separating it and didn't want to separate it and don't know why we should separate it. We, so we have to leave, somebody has to tell me what we really need, right? Once we know what we really need, then as shown in the cartoon on the right side here, then everybody will try to find a path to that goal. And then what will happen is the best path will win. And that's what needs to happen, right? So what is it that we need? If you're a network manager, then you say, well, what I really need is virtualization because I really don't want to worry about the physical resources. I want to be able to get the network in the shape I want. That's a good definition. That's a good definition because it tells me what I want and then other people can think about how they can give it to you, right? Virtualization. Orchestration. I want to manage thousands of devices at the same time. Programmability. I want to be able to change in instant dynamic scaling. I want to be able to scale my network from two nodes to 2,000 nodes very fast. Automation, visibility, I want to be able to see it. Performance, optimization, multi-tenancy, I want to be able to rent it out to many, many different customers. Service integration, openness, you know, basically I, I want people to be able to plug in their, their plugins. And finally, unified management of computing, networking and storage. And this is one of the most important ones, is that the days of virtualizing the computers are gone, virtualizing the storage is gone, and virtualizing network alone are gone. Really today what we need is a way to do all of that together. Unified, unified management of virtual computers, virtual networks, virtual storage. So that's what we want, all of these things and the thing that can give us this, maybe we can call that software-defined network. Okay? Now, notice in this definition, there is no how. Okay? And please feel free to interrupt me during the talk. Yes. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I, I don't think if I just got visibility, I would call that SDN. Or if I just got automation, I would call SDN. So, yeah, basically, this is what we need and hopefully software defined networking can do all of that and you know hopefully i mean and maybe even more so one of the solutions then comes up and this could not come through the open networking foundation because their definition itself was very narrow and restricted was that can we put anything other than open flow can we do something without separating the control and data plane and so on and so forth so people moved to linux foundation and the linux foundation defined what we call open daylight style SDN. Now I call that SDN version 2 because that is very different from OMF definition of SDN. Basically, as long as you can do any of those things that I listed in the previous slide, and there are many protocols that can do that, they're allowed in this model. 
And this model, as you see in this picture, which is the open daylight, is the is the SDN controller developed by the Linux Foundation. Allows you to use PCEP, SMTP, XMPP, DGP, Optlex, OpenFlow, anything to control the network element. And the latest addition by the way is Optlex, as you can see. Optlex is a proposal in IEPF which says that really we really don't need to do this control plane, data plane separation. What we need is the policy separation. We need to be able to specify the policy and then the policies are implemented by people downstream. And, and so that is the problem we are solving for SDN and not really anything else. And, and I, I will discuss that as to how that really makes a big difference. And then many of the other protocols listed here are already existing, and and they can and SMTP, for example, is used as as the southbound protocol. So this is where the southbound comes in. The middle is the controller, and anything that is goes to the devices from the controller is called southbound. Anything which goes upward is called northbound. So the southbound protocols right now, according to NS, is open flow, but according to the rest of the world, there are many. And so this is called no open flow SDN because NO here stands for not only. Some of you are familiar with big data, no SQL. No SQL means not only SQL. You use SQL and use something else as well. So similarly, no open flow means not only open flow. That means multi-protocol. And, and so there is work now existing starting in every forum, which you can think of networking forum on software-defined approaches to their base, right? IETF itself has many protocols which have changed their direction to basically provide you the programmability, to provide the features that I listed in the previous slide. If you see the work that is going on in XMTP now, or ALTO, or I2RS, or PCEP, all of these are candidates for these southbound protocols here. All of these are candidates. Now, not all of them will win, but the purpose of this talk was to just to make sure that people understood that there are alternatives, that they are being discussed. This is the same thing that happened when I was doing ATM networking. And everybody said, oh, ATM is the thing that is going to take over the world. But then people found an alternative called MPLS, called MPLS. And that was the least disruptive of all the protocols because it didn't require changing much of the equipment in the world and get almost the same thing that ATM was providing. And so MPLS survived and ATM went away. So same thing happen, you know, same thing can happen here as well. So just you have to be aware of it. And in general, networking is actually a religion. Um, and uh, whatever people believe in, they feel that that is the right way. If you believe in control plane separation, that is the way. Everything else is wrong. And so that is what is the debate which is going on right now in the industry. The debate is, is the centralization necessary? Can we do distributed way? And if centralization is required, then you know, what are the problems with centralization? So everything is being questioned. Is the control plane totally to be removed? Is it really, do we really need to remove the control plane? Is it really good? Is it really bad? Okay, both sides. And is it really necessary to have one southbound protocol? Can we have more than one? And the, finally, the end result would be that if the industry finds an easier way to solve the same problem, the easiest solution will win. And that is what is happening. And so I just want to show, show you what is the separation of control plane means by this cartoon. So on the left, you see the completely the control plane has been removed from all the bottom elements. And there is one control plane, or control plane, which does all the thinking. In 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 some terms, it, this could be called micromanagement, or dictatorship, or whatever it is. But on the right side, you see the policy controls, centralization of control. So the control is centralized. So the person sitting is standing in the center has complete control, but the other people have complete brain as well. So Obama, it's like this. Obama tells his five people, please, our policy is not to you know do this. And they tell the other five people, and they tell the other five people, and 300 million people will not do that. And so as long as people do what you want, that's all you need. That is what is called centralization of control. Separation of control is probably an extreme, because if you separate the control totally, then what happens if the controller goes away? And 
then you need to have, you can say, well, I will have a standby controller, but that is not how the real world works. I mean, in, in, in the real world, the manager doesn't really control everything you do. It doesn't tell you for every packet what you do. It tells you, well, here's the policy, for, and, and then you apply those policies. If there are defaults, if, if there's an exception, then you go back to the manager. And, and then there's a the problem of how, how do you handle the exception. So in some cases, the exception could be handled by exceptional policy rather than being sending the case back to the manager. So in, in for example, in open flow, the data packet is sent back to the controller. So basically, that is not a clear separation of control and data plane in some sense. But, um, but um, so, so the idea is that policies are much easier to share than big, big tables. So, so there are arguments on both sides. And I'm not going to go much further than this, but I really want to get into the next part, MSD, which is really more interesting to me. So any question about SVN before I get on to MSD? All right, um, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so let me, let me just tell you, whenever the people talk about the cost of the switches, now I'm going to give you both sides of the argument. Okay, so these are not my arguments in sense that so the cost of a chip depends upon how much memory, how many those um, what do you call those uh, those uh, those um, content the P cams, size of the P cams and things etc etc. Et and um, those are the ones which are leading, right? And the, and the cost of the chip itself is not that much. So basically, yes, your point is valid that. What we want is a simplification of the hardware, but simplification of the hardware does not mean removing the control. Now, removing the control, I don't know whether it really simplifies the hardware. That you have to really study, and and I and and I can find people who can argue on either side that the control is really the cost of the hardware. But was the cost of the hardware also included the cost of the proprietary things? And so yes, things have to be standardized, but to the extreme where every little detail has to come from the other side is is probably increasing some complexity which should not have been there. Okay. All right. So now thanks to at and and other carriers, they came up with MSV. And the idea was simple and I will explain again, you know, back to at and in, in some sense, is that basically somebody realized that yeah, we need a simple box. We need to implement everything in a simple box, just like, you know, Sam said, a white box implementation, so we need everything to be software based. The hardware is so fast now nowadays that we really don't need a specialized hardware. We could implement most of the functions in a software. And then we talk to somebody, why in a box, you know, we can just put into a virtual machine and that way we get all the advantages of the cloud computing right in the in the carrier infrastructure. So that is all MSV is. Network function virtualization, which is basically virtualization and you know of all the functions. And that, with that strong idea, now you get, let's see what we can get. Can we get virtualization? Of course. Can we get orchestration? Yes. If you're inside the cloud, you can orchestrate. Programmability, dynamic scaling, automation, visibility, everything that I listed in the previous slide is almost here. Okay? Because, and the good thing is that all of this is already there in the cloud. The cloud do it every day. Amazon, Amazon does it every day. So, so, so the idea is what MSV wants is is almost what we need and is almost what is there. Okay? So now the question is what is missing? Yeah, something is missing here which was unified unified control and all that. And um, and maybe right now the while there are clouds, but the virtual networking and the virtual computing and the virtual um, storage, they still need to be more unified. And um, so yes. Yeah, but I think the good news is that we are almost there and we can start and we start seeing as to what business opportunities we can get from here. And the the another good news is that the cloud is now a success in the sense that there is nobody in the world who can come who can who can um, argue that well cloud is not a good idea. Okay? So it's a win win combination because the tenants love it, the providers love it. And so the idea is ISPs, this is an opportunity for ISP to do the same thing in the networking area, what the clouds have done in the computing area, to provide 
tenants exactly what they need, whenever they need it, whatever size they need it, and so on and so forth. And the first customer of the ISP will be themselves, because if they start implementing NSV, they will need virtual machines. They will need virtual machines that, could, that need to be connected by via virtual, via wide area networks. They will need the links that can be created on demand. They will need the capacity that can be created on demand to connect these virtual machines of their own. So that is called service chaining. Each of these functions, which we call virtual network functions, VNFs, HLR, VLR, NME, whatever, these are all virtual machines now and they would be created on demand wherever they are needed, wherever there is a traffic, and we will need to provide the resources, connecting connecting resources to them, and that service chaining is what you know we call a workflow, and that is the topic of our rest of our talk. But before I go to the rest of the talk, I wanted to make sure that we remove the word N from NSV. And really, there is no need to call it N network function virtualization, because if we call it function virtualization, then we really open up our eyes because function virtualization is something that everybody else in the world needs. If you go to a bank, they would love this model where they we can divide their functions into modules that can virtualize and we give them five VMs um, modules and they are done. They start a business, a banking business. You go to a mortgage company, you give them five VMs of different kind, of course, different functionality. So everybody would love these VFs, and I think this is an opportunity for the carriers. And the reason I'm saying this is an opportunity for the carriers is because most of these businesses are globally distributed, and they are really not able to get into a single cloud and do that. They really need global footprint, which ISPs can provide much better than, than computing providers like Amazon are or Google can provide. In fact, Google is almost there, but basically Amazon is still not a networking provider. And so, so the idea is the networking providers can provide virtual functions that are distributed throughout the world and are created on demand and are connected on demand as necessary. Okay? So now we are asked from NFV and we are on the FV and we are onto a topic which is now called by Cisco as clouds of clouds. Basically, think of a bank or think of any other businesses. What they will have is lots of clouds all over the world, and but their applications are now distributed among all these clouds, connected by wide area network, and now they need your help, at &T. Why? Because they need to be able to add and delete workflows at the load or locality changes. You know, sometimes there is more load in this part of the world, sometimes in other part of the world, and so they need to change the workflows. The application developers designing a workflow need not be aware of the middle boxes. But this is another thing is that now to design all these global things, there's too much complexity. So the programmer who is designing the designing the application should really not worry about where are the middle boxes, where are the cloud computers, where are the clouds, and so on and so forth. So the developers will simply have their, I and mean, I will show you the picture in the next slide, their view, very simple view of what they need to see and what they need to work on. Then there will be architects who take these applications and then extend them by putting other things such as middle boxes, firewalls, intrusion detection, security, performance optimization, band optimizers, whatnot. And then there are the people who will deploy this architecture and these people have to worry about really more than, they, they are worrying about day-to-day -day running of the operation, which is quantity and location of the resources inside the various clouds and between the clouds. So the key point here is that this new opportunity, which is Clouds of Clouds brings in, is to virtualize the wide area network just as it is done inside the cloud today. Okay? Inside the cloud today, we have solved quite a bit of problem as to how to virtualize it you know, all kinds of protocols, VXLANs, and, you know, so on and so forth. Now, we need to do similar things on the, on the, on the other side, outside, right? Now, so the, the key point is there are differences, though. The differences are in, of course, the distances, and therefore, the quantity of the information that has to be exchanged, and the, and the, and the amount of 
time needed and all that. So, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is that the cloud and the cloud of cloud is just beginning, and this is an ideal opportunity for the global service providers like at and to really start thinking about as to how they can provide this connectivity among multiple clouds and really provide their own clouds as well. So workflow. I use the word workflow without really clearly defining it in the previous slide, but a workflow could be like this. On the left side of the line, I have shown a simple application being developed. A somebody trying to develop a web server and web client. So he will write a web client application and a web server application, which will go over some socket programs, socket and interface in an operating system through TCP, through IP, and that's very simple, right? He's done with that, or she's done with that. On the right side, I show the deployment. The deployment is not that simple. Basically, when it is deployed, that application is deployed, we put a firewall at the edge, we put intrusion detection boxes all over, and the difference between these two boxes, by the way, is that the firewall is application level box. It looks, it, 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 it basically combines all the application messages into one, and into application message, complete message, all the packets into message, and then looks at it and then does something with it. Whereas the IDS generally get packet by packet, and they have to make a decision based upon packet by packet. There are different layers. So anyway, so so the idea is that the that the development and deployment workflows are different slightly, and somehow this translation, we need some way to be able to to automate much of this. And that's what we are working on. That's what we are actually just finished working on, in the sense that Suhasi Paz's thesis is on this app fabric. So what does app fabric do is, and this is actually a key slide for our presentation, so I will probably spend a bit more time on this. So let's uh, start from the bottom. <coughs> in the bottom, you see three clouds, which are connected by a wide area network. Now, one of the clouds could be the enterprise's own private cloud, and therefore they use OpenStack to manage it. And OpenStack provides them virtual host, virtual storage, virtual network. The second cloud is um, basically EC2, um, which is Amazon's cloud. And Amazon provides virtual host and so on and so forth. Now, they need to connect these, and third cloud could be one of those two, maybe the Google or whatever your favorite cloud provider is. And that's, that's yet another um, stack. <clears throat> and then in between connecting those different clouds is the wide area network, which hopefully is controlled by something you know which is open daylight, or you know, maybe some other controller that you love, network controller. So what is happening now is now we have a problem where we have applications which are not inside the cloud. So we have. Basically, the clouds have become what they previously were the servers, and now we need something on the top of these to be able to manage all these different clouds so that you know the manager who is now managing the application can manage all of this as if it was all in one place. All right? So what we need to begin with in our app, app travel platform is a resource driver for OpenStack, so something that can talk to OpenStack. A resource driver for open daylight, a resource driver for EC2, and so on. So we have the southbound interfaces, just like before, except that these are at a much higher level. These are talking to the clouds and not to the boxes. And so we have a southbound interface. Then we have the app fabric platform, which is the core. And then on the top, we have three interfaces. One is for the developers. One is for the architect, and one is for the administrators. So as you can see, this is the development time. Sorry. This is the development time. This is the design time, you know, when the basically installation of the, in the time. And this is the run time. The last one is the run time. So this design, deployment, and run time. And we have three interfaces. And these seven boxes basically now exist in the sense that we have implemented them. And so we, we actually four boxes exist for sure, the, the, these three boxes plus the platform. 
and we are implementing these one by one right now. So with this, what happens is <coughs> now with this, what happens is it allows application architect to specify guidelines for creation of new workflows, including middle boxes. So a, a, a architect could sit down and say, well, I want to de de deploy this application. And you can take any of your favorite application and say, well, here are the modules I need. And I need to put a firewall here. I need to put a load balancer here. I need to put a, a security, whatever, you know, IDS and van optimizer, so on and so forth. All that, that will, they, they can design workflows with the tools that we provide. Second thing, when the developers basically are in that sense are free and they can de develop their resources and then they, they, they provide the interfaces that we need to, to really create them and all that. And then the administrators can specify the policies that, okay, if the load on this goes up by more than 50%, then please create another workflow copy. So the workflows are basically instances that you keep creating when you need them and you can keep deleting them when you don't need them, right? And the whole process is automated. So they automate the entire process of creating the new workflows, installing them, managing them during runtime, uninstalling them as necessary. And the workflow creation includes virtual networks, computers, storage. So it's not just the network alone. If you need, if you need to create a computer, you need to create a network for it, and you need, to need everything else that goes along with it. And currently, in our implementation, all interfaces are XML-based. So basically, I mean, my students, they write a whole file full of XML statements. And so that probably is not very convenient, but this is good enough for a PhD thesis. And we, what we want to plan to do is to implement GUI console so that if, if, a, if an architect really wanted to do something, they could just pull some graphical things and say, OK, here's my workflow. But that doesn't happen right now. Okay. Go ahead. So first of all, what we have is we don't really separate the planes. What we work is based upon the policies. All right. So there is a data center controller. Okay. This could be, for example, the cloud stack or you know open stack or open daylight, whatever. These are the controllers. How they do it is their business. I don't care. Okay, there is a central controller that talks to them, and this is basically where App Fabric is. And the App Fabric sits here, and then so the central controller talks to them, and then App Fabric talks to them. But it doesn't really, it doesn't micromanage them. It just tells them the policies that please create two VMs when if the load is more than fifty percent here. Okay, and how does it create this for two VMs? Is is Amazon's problem? Okay. Similarly, the app controller tells, and this central controller app fabric belongs to AT&T, central, the application controller tells the AT&T, look, here's my policy. How AT&T implements it is AT&T's problem. The central, the, the application controller does not really see or need to see the AT&T's, I mean, basically there's a contract here. But if AT&T doesn't do it, then the contract will be violated, so it is taken care of at that level and not at the physical level. Does that answer Tom's question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is, what we do is the app application, then there are many of these application service providers, and what will happen is they will put the policies. So there is this problem that you know, somebody may put a policy that you cannot satisfy, and you don't accept it. You say, well, your policy doesn't pass our test, our filter, and so this is not acceptable. Or it is quite possible that you don't have the resources uh, right now. So you say, well, right now we cannot implement your thing. But these things are done as it is done right now. Right now it is done by contracts. And so AT&T keeps complete control. It's like this. When I want to send a packet to a packet from A to B through AT&T, I cannot tell AT&T how to send this packet. I just tell them the destination is B, and it goes to B. Somehow AT&T finds the path to B. Same thing will happen here, is that we tell them that this is what we need. And that might include that we will need a 100 megabit line between Amazon and Google, whatever. I mean, you know, and so AT&T will have to figure that out, policy business. And and then, you know, be ready to implement it, right? So this is more at that interface level is that we have a interface, which we can call a control interface, 
because basically this is controlled as no data plane data goes in, goes to this the after the word policy here. So this is basically the control plane. And then, so the, the stack is in the control plane, but nobody takes control over anybody else's resources. So that's another important point. at and does not get control over the resources of, of Amazon or, or the application. And application does not get control over the at and resources either. But there is an interface which allows them to talk to each other and request whatever they need and satisfy the contract, whatever there is, right? Okay. So resource control, and this is the this is basically the <coughs> the point I was making was that the tenants keep complete control over their data. So this is one of the challenges is that how do you do in many of these policies when you cannot look at the data? For example, if you are managing bank of America traffic, they won't let you look at the messages and say, well, okay, this is a and this is a bank account balance or something or something. You know, they don't want anybody to look at that information. And so really, how do you deal with this thing? And, and so we have a method of that. And, and, and basically, that is a much more detailed talk about the design of the whole thing. And then the NFTs keep complete, complete control of their equipment. So that's another thing is that nobody looks at, nobody goes inside the AT&T network and says, oh, router X, please, change your flow table to this one. Obviously, at and will not want anybody to control their flow table, but even, Controlling flow table I actually is totally different out of the scope right now of the stack because I think that is micromanagement at, at, at a very high level. So, so anyway, so, so so the idea is that we we are doing at the policy level and we tell the router that this is the policy and 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 there are ways of ex, ex, and basically what we have done is we have designed the ways of expressing the policies using this XML. And um, of course, these will all be extended if they are going to find a place in the real world. And um, and they will be made much nicer to use and easier to use. But right now, we're just proving a concept. So virtual functions and middle boxes can be located anywhere on the global internet. And so that's another thing is that locating them is a, it's such a problem because, I mean, you know, you don't want to really put the intrusion detection in America and then put the firewall in China and so on and so forth. We really need to keep things close together. And tenants and NSP can own open ADN modules and NSP can offer service chaining as a service. So I mean this is right there is a service for you. Service chaining that you are doing for NSV, you could offer it to other people. <coughs> so there are many challenges and um, one of the challenges is, is dynamics that the as the state of the server changes the network requirements changes. It is content sensitive, reads and writes and so on and so forth. So how do you worry about that? And so so that is another issue. Distributed control. Equipment belongs to infrastructure, data belongs to the tenants, scale is massive and stateful services. And then there are two levels of services. Message level and the packet level, like I showed in the previous picture. Some things that go all the way to the application, some things that don't go all the way to the application. And there are some tricks in handling both of those. Now, where can you use these things? So there are many applications. Basically, the idea is very simple, is that the days of working inside the cloud are gone. Everybody has to work between the clouds. And the carriers are in the ideal shape to provide this network that can be as, as, as flexible as it is inside the cloud today. All right, now, so Internet of Things. If we are going to have Internet of Things, that means, you know, things will be all over the world, and they need to be connected. And not only connected, we need some services in between. We just don't want the ISPs to be transferring data from here to there. We want them to be somehow aggregating the data, getting some information maybe. So maybe we need something a little bit more than the communication, and I think this is an ideal opportunity for the ISPs to start that, is that basically along with this networking at the end, you get a small cloud where you can do whatever you want to do with it before you proceeding further with the data to the next cloud or the next point of aggregation or wherever that is. So this is where this unification comes in. The unification message is that basically the services include storage, computation, and communication at varying levels. Maybe there is very little storage, very little computation, but there is. 
along with most of it being communication if you want to keep it that way. A smart vans, which is basically is what I talked about before is that right now the van doesn't look at my message, it doesn't really do, it doesn't let me do any policies and it doesn't really know my difference between, you know, whether it is whether I want this message to go to service X or uh, to data center X or Y. Somehow, you know, it doesn't really know much at, uh, unless I put it there in the in explicitly. So a smart van will figure all this out uh, using um, the techniques that some of the techniques that we have developed and some more that we developed, of course. And so, so this will provide, you know, QoS accordingly. It will provide the locations of the paths accordingly and so on and so forth. Third is the massively distributed application. So nowadays there are lots of applications which are global, even gaming, gaming applications and they are basically distributed all over the world and they can really benefit if, if there is such a thing available. Right now they use the lowest possible facility from the from the ISPs because there is nothing available to them as such. So, so and things can change and, and of course gaming is not the only thing but there are other applications which can build upon these. So that actually I'm kind of early in my presentation. I still have 14 minutes or 13 minutes left. But um, here's the thing, summary. So the summary is that the technology is changing faster than deployment right now. It's actually changing very fast. So we have to be basically in some sense, um, you know, deploy it fast as well. Either one of the two choices, either wait or, you know, or, or do or something like that. But um, and have to be careful as to what we do regardless in any way. But the the thing is that NFV is a great idea, and um, I think it is going to provide a lot of stuff that we need, and that service chaining, etc., needs to be you know will need to be required. And then the question is, if you are solving it for yourself, then why don't we solve it for your customers as well? And so just instead of NFV, let's just call it FV, and let's just do the virtual functions via the ISP and all global enterprises can can use that um, virtual functions. App Fabric is at least a proof of concept which shows that you can manage multiple clouds from a central place and um, and uh, it allows three different interfaces for for putting the workflow together for instantiation. Basically the whole life cycle of workflows which includes initializing, configuring, deploying, taking them off, and so on and so forth. And it's all automated. That's the other thing is that the workflows are created automatically by the policies specified. And we have designed it so that NSPs keep complete control over their resources, and tenants keep complete control over their traffic. It can be implemented incrementally now. So we don't need to change your hardware. Whatever protocols they're using, basically, I mean, as I said, this is a hierarchical control. So we tell the work controller, whichever way you control, that please create this thing, and then of course you have to create that. Um, and of course, um, one thing I should say that the whole goal of this talk is also to hopefully create some collaboration. Universities always need money, and so basically, hopefully, some of it can come from AT&T. <laughs> so with that, I don't know if there are any questions. By the way, I do have a paper. I do have a paper which appeared in the November issue of 2000, November, just very recently. Number network virtualization and software defined networking for cloud computing a survey. And believe it or not, this paper climbed to the top 10 ever downloaded papers from Hyperbole Communication Magazine. It is, last time when I checked it was number 10, but I was really surprised because it's only a few months old while the top 10 list is few years old. I mean, so it really completes with a lot of other papers. So you might want to check that out. With that, I want to go back to this and most likely, most importantly to this picture, to see if there are any questions about anything.
Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Sham, thank you, and Tom, for all for arranging all this. And I really enjoyed the talk myself. And hopefully, this is not the end of the talk. This is the beginning of the talk. Okay. And so hopefully, we work together on something. Okay. With that, thank you.